Russia invaded Ukraine, the United States has provided approximately $75 billion in aid. But some in Congress and others in the policy world say it is time to reconsider this strategy. They question whether an ongoing financial commitment to Ukraine is sustainable and whether Ukraine can actually win the war. Furthermore, they say that continued financial support could have perilous geopolitical consequences. Those on the other side say that funds directed to support the war are a necessary investment in democracy and that a Russian victory would encourage Putin to invade other neighbors. Against this background and in partnership with the Council on Foreign Relations, we debate the following. Should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine? This is open to debate. I'm John Donvan. We're in partnership with the Council on Foreign Relations for this one, recording this debate at the Council's New York headquarters to take on the very question that Congress is due to take up shortly. The U.S. commitment to Ukraine and its war with Russia. Since the war broke out in 2022, uh, we have examined the conflict multiple times, beginning when there was generally a broad consensus that America would and should stand with Ukraine and spend money to do so. Now, literally years on, that consensus is proving itself more debatable than ever. And that's our focus for this debate, where the question we're asking is, should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine? So let's get to it. Let's welcome our debaters to the stage first. Ambassador Paula Dobryansky. <laughs> President of the German Marshall Fund, Heather Conley. <laughs> Professor John Mearsheimer. Lieutenant Colonel Retired, Daniel L. Davis. So let's get into our opening statements. Each debater will have four minutes to tell us why they're answering yes or no in answer to our question. And first up, we have political scientist and international relations expert John Mearsheimer. John is a professor at the University of Chicago, where he's been teaching since 1982. John, this is the fifth time you have debated with us. So no. that's, that's high up in our, in, our, uh, in, our, in our program. There are very few who have done that number with us, so we appreciate it. And your answer to the question, should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine, is yes. Please tell us why. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Proponents of continued support to Ukraine usually make two arguments. The first and more ambitious argument is that if we give Ukraine support down the road, uh, Ukraine will be able not only to stymie the Russian offensive, but they will be able to recapture territory that they have lost. The second less ambitious alternative argument is that if we give continued aid to the Ukrainians, they will not be able to take back territory that they lost, but they will be able to hang on to the territory that they now control. And the end result is that will put them in a strong bargaining position in future negotiations with the Russians. Danny and I believe that both of these arguments are fundamentally wrong. That the Ukrainians are doomed. They're going to lose. Option one and option two are both going to fail. And the principal reason is because of the military balance of power between the two sides. The fact is that the Russians now have a decisive advantage over the Ukrainians. And as time goes by, that advantage is going to increase, not decrease. There's nothing the West can do to rectify that balance. The Ukrainians, again, are doomed. So Danny and I actually have an alternative strategy that we think is a good way for dealing with this problem. And it focuses on diplomacy. And our basic argument is what we should do is engage in diplomacy, get the Ukrainians to engage in with diplomacy with the Russians and try to settle this conflict, come up with a settlement, come up with an agreement. And that agreement should do everything it can to freeze the present situation on the ground, in place, and furthermore, end the shooting so that no more Ukrainians are killed, and indeed no more Russians are killed as well. Now the question is, how do you realize this settlement that I just described? The way you do it is by creating a neutral Ukraine. A neutral Ukraine is a Ukraine that has no strategic ties with the West, 
number one, and number two, does not present a serious threat to Russia, gives the Russians no incentives to try to wreck Ukraine. That's the best way to do this. What does this mean in more practical terms? First of all, it means no NATO expansion into Ukraine. That's not possible. Number two, what it means is that you have to put an end to U.S. support for Ukraine. You have to break the tie between Ukraine, the strategic tie between Ukraine and the United States to create a truly neutral Ukraine, which is the only way out of this mess that we are now in. Thank you. Thank you, John. Our next speaker, Ambassador Paula Dobryansky. Ambassador Dobryansky is the former Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs, senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, as well as vice chair for the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Ambassador, you are arguing no in answer to the question, should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine? Here's your chance to tell us why. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Cutting aid to Ukraine will benefit Putin. It will advance his goals, his objectives. And at the same time, it will destabilize Euro the European security architecture. Our aid to Ukraine must continue because it's vital and it's also determinative. And let me explain why. Ukraine is fighting for its very survival as a sovereign, free nation but it is also fighting for the very shared values, democratic values that we hold together. But significantly, let me go to one of the core arguments that I think is important here, that Heather and I believe strongly in, and that is that the aid that we provide is less than 4% of our defense budget. We don't do the fighting, we just give the aid. And here, the fact is that that's not a high price also for containing Russia. We get a double goal and objective there. Did you know that of the $68 billion of military and other assistance that we have given, in fact, to Ukraine, did you know that 90% supports the American workers and also American factories? That's phenomenal. Ukraine aid, the fact is it boosts, actually, jobs at home the American people, our economy, and also security all benefit. Now, if Russia gets a pass, by the way, on its brutal aggression against Ukraine, the fact is that you're going to have an emboldened Russia that will be exponentially higher and tougher. And continuing to support Ukraine now actually is one of the most effective courses of action. Here, saving resources for the long run, and also maintaining U.S. credibility with our allies, our partners, and the global community, and maintaining our leadership. Abandonment of Ukraine will also inexorably encourage China and other authoritarians, by the way, in the Middle East and also in, in the Indo-Pacific, to launch aggressions of their own. Taiwan, great case in point. So American weakness and perception of American weakness will really impact us. And finally, aid to Ukraine incentivizes and motivates the Ukrainians to sustain their fight. I want to conclude on two points before we close. One, the author, John Maxwell, he said, there are two kinds of people in life, those who make things happen and those who wonder what happened. We don't want the latter. But I want to close on this, if I may, just a tribute to Joe Lieberman, because he's been through here many times. Senator Lieberman passed away. He was someone who believed strongly against aggression in Ukraine and the need for supporting uh, aid to Ukraine. Very wise policy advice. Thank you. Next up, we have Lieutenant Colonel retired Daniel L. Davis. Daniel fought in the Gulf War as well as in Afghanistan, has been awarded two bronze stars. He's now a senior fellow and military expert at Defense Priorities. Uh, Daniel, you're also host of the podcast, The Daniel Davis Deep Dive Show, correct, on YouTube. Um, you are saying that Congress should end the funding for the war in Ukraine, um, and now it is your chance to tell us why. Thank you. 
I'm really honored to be here and to talk to this uh, august body that, that truly sets the standard for foreign policy in the United States and has for decades. It is a true privilege to, uh, to be here. I have 20-something uh, years of military experience, four combat deployments. I fought in a large tank battle in Desert Storm with the 2nd Armored Cav Regiment. We also served time on the east-west border in Germany, where we had to patrol against the uh, potential onslaught of the Soviet Union coming in. So I had to actually study the Soviet doctrine, their tanks, their, the way they fight, the way they do offense, the way they do defense, in terrain very similar to what's going on in Ukraine right now. I also was the second in command of an armored cav squadron for the U.S. 1st Armored Division in the mid-2000s. And, and lastly, I also served in the future combat systems where we were trying to project the future uh, armored warfare systems in the United States. Believe me when I tell you there is no chance that Ukraine will ever succeed in its war against uh, Russia. There is no path to military victory for Ukraine Period. It doesn't matter if we give 60 billion. It doesn't matter if we give another 120 billion, 200 billion. It's not going to make any difference because the fundamentals that go into build combat power at the national level are decisively and irrevocably on the Russian side. It doesn't matter whether the cause is right. It doesn't matter whether we're afraid of how things may look at the end or whether it may embolden Putin. Any of those things, those are all secondary to the core issue. You cannot buy your way into this situation where you can turn the tables because you can't undo the fundamentals. The, the air power on the Russian side is overwhelmingly and irrevocably on the Russian side. Air defense, their military industrial capacity to be able to crank out large numbers of, of artillery, to, uh, artillery ammunition, the, uh, the weapons themselves, uh, the, the drones, electronic warfare, and most importantly of all, the people. Russia has more people, and they will always have more people. They have more trained folks than the Ukraine side does. And you see already there's a big issue with whether Congress is even going to give this money, and I assure you that's not a temporary condition, and it's throughout the West. They will never be able to match what happens on the other side, and even if they could, the manpower, ultimately it's about men, not machines, not money. And right now, there is no path to turn it around. In our view, it is... Uh, unconscionable to continue hoping against hope that the Ukraine side can win if we just give a little bit more cash because it won't work out that way. Thank you. And now in the cleanup position, we have Heather Conley. Heather is president of the German Marshall Fund, a sought after foreign policy analyst. Heather, you are answering no to the question, should Congress n stop funding the war in Ukraine? Please tell us why. Of course, Congress should not stop funding Ukraine, but tragically over the last seven months, they have suspended it and Ukraine is now desperate for ammunition. Let's talk about cost. What does this cost the American people? Since February of 2022, Council on Foreign Relations has gathered the data. The United States has put $75 billion towards Ukraine, humanitarian, financial, and military aid. 46 billion of that is military assistance. Three billion of that went straight into great American companies uh, and the industrial complex to help build those weapons. 30.3 million uh, went to, as the United States was uh, losing its antiquated, more antiquated military stocks and sending that to Ukraine, the United States is now modernizing its military stocks. So the benefit here to the United States, the supplemental stays here. The, the amount of assistance we've provided Ukraine is less than the annual budget of the state of Virginia. Keep this in context. What are our allies doing? According to the Kiel Institute in Germany, the Europeans have provided over 144 billion euros for Ukraine, humanitarian, financial, and military, dwarfing the 75 billion that we've put forward. So our allies are increasing at their share of this burden. Let's talk about the costs if Ukraine fails. We will see NATO, the United States has 100,000 forces in Europe, 40,000 of those are in Central and Eastern Europe. We will have to deploy more forces, more air defense, because our NATO allies will begin soft mobilization themselves if Ukraine loses. China, Iran, North Korea are completely emboldened. 
Ukraine is not doomed. Ukraine has held the second largest military in the world at bay. They pushed them back substantially in September of 2022. They have opened the Black Sea. They have pushed the Russian Black Sea feet back to Georgia. John, there is no negotiating table. This is for survival. This is existential. Russia has, has absolutely destroyed every legal treaty they've ever signed. They violate it all. And Ukraine was neutral. In, in 1990, it was in their constitution that they were neutral. In 2010, they, their constitution forbade them for joining NATO. They changed that in 2014 when Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea and invaded the Donbass. This is Russia's responsibility. They should be held accountable. And Congress must support freedom and prosperity. Thank you. All right, now we will move into our discussion. So we've heard our debaters, uh, Heather Conley, Paula Dobryansky, John Mearsheimer, and Daniel Davis make their arguments. As we get into the conversation, I just want to ask two questions for your indulgence on two things. Um, we have an ambassador, we have a president, we have a military officer, we have a professor, but do you mind, may I have your permission to use first names for Please. the duration of this? And may I have your permission to interrupt you? <laughs> if I feel that that is called for. One last thing is I understand three of you are members of the council. Could you raise your hands? That's fantastic and uh, uh, deep, deepens the connection between us on this evening. So in uh, answering the question, should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine? We've heard uh, John Mearsheimer and uh, Daniel Davis. Uh, Daniel, you go by Danny. Danny. Right? Danny, yes. yeah. but it's not Johnny. <laughs> no, okay, <laughs> all right, same for me. Um, We've heard Danny Davis and uh, John Mearsheimer argue that uh, very, very fundamentally they say that uh, the Ukrainians are going to lose, that more people are going to die. They su suggest an alternative route being diplomacy to creating a neutral U Ukraine. They absolutely rule out the idea of Ukraine ever being brought into NATO. Um, but they, they say the Russians have advantages that cannot be overcome, including the size of its population, the depth of its military industrial complex. And fundamentally, they say to continue to support Ukraine, which would be to continue to encourage Ukraine to continue to fight is unconscionable. On the other side, we have um, uh, Heather Conley and Paula Darbyansky arguing that support for Ukraine is vital, that the Ukrainians are fighting for the values that all of us believe in, that in fact, uh, it's a very, very good return on the money that is spent in the fact that the Ukrainians are the ones doing the fighting, that it's leading to jobs in the United States in the, uh, the, the resupply of the equipment that's being sent over to Ukraine, and that it's not really that very much money in the first place when you put it against the total national budget. And they conclude by saying, Ukraine is not doomed. I want to take a question to the side that's arguing no, not to stop the funding. Uh, your opponents, your opponents laid down a kind of moral marker by saying that continuing to uh, encourage the Ukrainians to keep fighting is unconscionable because of the deaths and the uh, f fundamental um, lost co nature of the cause. And I want to ask you, does morality at all figure into this conversation and into your, the arguments that you're making? And I'll take that to you first, uh, Paula. Um, my answer is that uh, moral dimension does fit in here. But also, I think that Ukraine, as a sovereign country, should make its own choice. It is fighting not just for the United States. It's already put its own blood and treasure on the, uh, on the ground for not only the goals and objectives of Ukraine, but for the European community and for the global community at large. So in that sense, yes, but I don't think that we should be the ones judging and determining that is their choice, not our choice in this case. John? I think there's no question that Ukraine should make its own choice. And the argument that Danny and I are making up here applies to the Ukrainians as well as to the Americans. We just want to put an end to this war. What we're interested in doing is minimizing the number of Ukrainians who are killed moving forward. And number two, making sure that we maximize the amount of territory they get to keep. That's what's of critical importance here. And it's important that the Ukrainians understand this basic calculus that we're laying out. And the United States is a very powerful 
country that has influence all around the world and certainly has a lot of leverage in Ukraine. And what we ought to do is figure out the basic facts of this story and explain to the Ukrainians what they should do, which is pursue diplomacy instead of continuing to fight and die in a lost cause. And Heather, let me go to Heather first. What would be the consequences of such course of course of action? Well, the Ukrainians aren't going to stop. This is existential to them. There's no negotiation that the Russians have ever upheld. See Minsk one, two, three. The, Vladimir Putin is very clear. He will not stop. You look at Bucha and Irpin, that's what Russian occupation looks like. We've seen 20 days of Mariupol. That is what occupation, there's no negotiating with that. It, they will not survive as a nation, and I believe Ukraine, uh, if they are forced uh, to accept Russian domination, they'll go to an insurgency. They will not stop. This is survival. And the 32nd. By the way, the Ukrainians have sought diplomacy. When the Turks held and brought Lavrov and also Kuleba, the foreign Ukrainian foreign minister, together to just set up a humanitarian corridor, that was part of negotiation to kind of bring it down. By the way, the Ukrainians continued fighting. Guess why? Because the Russians never respected at all that negotiation. They have sought negotiations. The, uh, Russians have not gone for negotiations. Danny, your fundamental point is that this may, regardless of what your opponents may want, victory is impossible. And yeah. they're telling you that that defeat cannot be acceptable. Cannot be yeah. accepted. Yeah, and of the I hear that a lot, and and that's it just anguishes me because I, I hear over and over that you know the the moral cause. Uh, this is you know that shouldn't be. Ukraine was invaded. That's black and white for sure. That was the case, and it sh this shouldn't. Are you saying are you saying that is black and white? If, that they were invaded. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. In February 2022, what's not black and white, and there is very much difference of opinion on whether you, Russia wanted to negotiate. I argue that they absolutely did. They were willing to negotiate in December of 2021, actually before that too. And it was the Ukraine side, the Ukraine side in April, in March of 2021, that said that issued this decree that said they were going to retake all the occupied areas, especially Ukraine, uh, yeah, especially Crimea. And the next month, they actually said that so they were willing to use force to get it back. And then that's when Russia started its build-up forces. Then in March of 2022, again, Russia said, we are willing to negotiate to end this right now. And they, they had the issue, the deal that was nearly done, or at least very far down the road, in Istanbul in, in, in March, April 2022, that was in deep six by a number of forces. But Putin, again, says he is willing to negotiate, and he has motivation to do so. And that's the bottom line. Because if does, you don't know, does, does he have you're motivation to do so only because the Ukrainians have put up such a good fight? Well, right now they're they're on the back end, and if we don't do it right now, this is the critical part. If you don't do it now because you want a better deal, the better chance is that Ukraine will lose and have to be given terms of surrender, not a negotiated settlement. Okay, I, I'd like you to take on the, the, the premises that Danny is laying out there and just respond to his argument that number one, they can't win. Number two, that, that uh, a negotiated settlement is possible. But first, the, the can't win part. What is your response to that? They absolutely can win. They have shown the ingenuity, the, um, the, they know what they're fighting for. The Russian forces have no idea why they're there and what they're fighting for. Can you Ukraine pause for one second? I just want to ask you, do you just dispute that, that the Russian forces are- 100% I disagree that, that, Sorry? 100% I dispute that. There okay, is I, no path to victory. No, no. Do you dispute that no. the, Russian, the Russian forces have low morale, no reason no, to understand why they're- No, don't agree with that at all. It's the opposite. All right, I just want to leave that for and let you continue your point. So in uh, March of 2021, the Russian military buildup was in fact a preparation for what they, uh, they implemented in February of 2022. And miraculously, the Ukrainian military held the Russian onslaught at bay. They had a, a success in September of 2022. Yes, last spring's and summer's counteroffensive was wholly un, un, unsuccessful because the Russians were allowed to develop defensive lines, uh, which was unfortunate. And now we are at a point where the Ukrainians are going to have to have active defense uh, to do those defensive lines so they, in fact, uh, can uh, it, have another spring of a counteroffensive in 2025. We are not doomed. Paul? Remember, rem rem remember that it was said that Ukraine would not last, I think it was four days. By the way, now we're going into the third year. 
Uh, Ukraine won the uh, victory in Kharkiv, in Kherson. In the Black Sea, by the way, in the Black Sea, they sunk another Russian vessel. And guess what? The grain is flowing right to the beginning of what it was at the beginning of the war. Quite phenomenal for a country that has not gotten the kind of equipment, military equipment that would really enable it to fight this war effectively. F-16, attackums, long-range missiles, these have not been provided. And there are military who would, with due respect to Danny, who would differ with you on that question that I have heard. Okay. And they say if they got that, they would be able to win. John Mearsheimer. <clears throat> a couple points. What happens in the naval war hardly matters at all. The question that matters is what happens in the ground war. There's no doubt that in 2022, the Ukrainians did quite well on the battlefield. It's in large part because the Russians went into Ukraine with a rather small army, 190,000 men at the most, and they were overextended, and that's why they suffered the defeats that Heather described in Kharkiv and Kherson. There's no question about that. But what happens in late September of 2022, this is the first year of the war, is that Putin mobilizes 300,000 men. Then over the course of 2023, 495,000 new soldiers joined the Russian army. And what's happened here is that the balance has shifted. And if you look at what happened in 2023, the Ukrainians in the start of that year suffered a significant defeat in Bakhmut. And then there was the counteroffensive, which was a total disaster. The Ukrainians suffered greatly. Go to 2024, the balance is continuing to shift against the Ukrainians. They've just lost Avdivka. And if you read the newspapers carefully every day, there's desperation, there's depression inside the ranks of the Ukrainians. They are back on their heels. And as I said, and as Danny said, looking forward, the balance is shifting further against the Ukrainians. So, so they're making an argument for momentum at this point. They Can are back on their heels, Sean, because we have failed to provide the ammunition that they need to counter that. We, we, don't, have, we don't have the ammunition to give them. We don't have the tubes to give them. We can give them money, but you can't fight a war with dollar bills. You need tubes. You need artillery. You need air power. We you need do, air defenses. We do you have need capabilities that we could provide them. We are choosing to not provide some of those long-range capabilities. And I would disagree with you. The naval component, Crimea, is absolutely critical to the future security of Ukraine, which is why the Ukrainians need a long-term resolution on Crimea. While the Russians are able to launch rockets from Crimea uh, into Ukraine, that will never be a safe and secure Ukraine without ultimately taking control, control over Crimea. I, I want to bring to the side that's arguing to stop the funding, your opponent's point that that would be such a gift to Vladimir Putin and that it reeks, of, they say, of American weakness and that it would lead to Putin being emboldened to keep going. What about that? Putin is going to keep going. It doesn't matter whether you give him the money or not. I cannot reinforce this enough. Just giving ammunition will not change the no, fundamentals. No, 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 I'm sorry. The, the premise of their question is, is Putin's going to get an appetite for other places, yeah. not just Ukraine. Oh, okay, that's a separate issue. Absolutely not. He does not. He has said emphatically from the beginning he's not. He has said very clearly, and I'm talking back to 2008. <laughs> Back to 2008, what he wanted. You can laugh if you want. It doesn't change the facts. He has said that he cares about his security on his border. He does not want Ukraine, uh, NATO in Ukraine. He has said he would be willing to use force to stop it, and he did. And it doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't, you don't have to trust him by any stretch. He doesn't have the physical capacity to go anywhere else. In two, in two full years of war, with $200 billion we gave them and thousands of armored vehicles, they have taken 17% of one strip. And now that we're supposed to believe that if the rest of it falls, that suddenly they're going to be able to go into the, you know, NATO countries with have 32 member alliance, there is no chance zero. Other side. Tell that to the Baltic states. Tell that I to will. Poland. Absolutely. Tell I that will. to Romania and all the other countries of Europe in this case. Sorry, they, they are very concerned, and actually we I have a are. kind of unanimity of purpose because of the concern about the threat. 
Look at what Putin said in Munich, the Munich Security Conference back in 2006. He stated very clearly what his intentions were, and he has proceeded through with it right to this day. But I have to say I'm a little confused, Danny, yes. because if Putin is going to keep going, which I absolutely agree with you, yes. how is he going to stop at the border? He has the capacity to go up to the Dnepr River. He doesn't have the capacity. It doesn't matter if he wants to. He can't go into the Baltics. He can't go into Poland. Then we he are doesn't not have doomed. Arm we need to give Ukraine what it needs to Only be able to finish men. the job. You can't give them men. They don't have the men and the training and all the things that go with it. There's much, much more well, than just ammunition. It's the army that uses it, and they don't have the capacity. French President Macron has just put on the table the potential of putting French or European <laughs> forces on the ground. We need to understand what that means. That means John, nuclear war. John Mearsheimer. Danny was talking about the negotiations that took place immediately after the war started on February 24th, 2022. Uh, they took place in Istanbul, and there was also an Israeli track. And what you see very clearly is that the deal that was being worked out was mainly to create a neutral Ukraine. Putin was not interested in conquering any territory in Ukraine at that point in time. He has not had an ambition to create a greater Israel. And furthermore, as Danny pointed out, he doesn't have the military capability. You want to remember that when the Wehrmacht went into Poland on September 1st, 1939, and they were only capturing about three-fifths of Poland because the Soviets were going to take the other two-fifths of Poland, the Wehrmacht went in with 1.5 million men. That's to conquer part of Poland, which is much smaller than Ukraine, which is a huge piece of real estate. As I told you, Putin went in with 190,000 troops at most. There was no way he could conquer all of Ukraine with 190,000 troops. And even given the buildup that now exists, there's no way that he could conquer all of Ukraine, much less move into Poland and pick a fight with NATO and the United States and end up in a nuclear war. But by the way, that's not, forgive me, that's not the point. The point here is also not about seizing of territory, too, I'd like to say that. Here, it's about a sovereign country's political future, its own right to make its choices. Putin has outright said that Ukraine doesn't exist as a country. He has said that over and over and over. So it's not just about territory. It is also about sovereign country political choices and an invasion that actually started back in 2014 and right up to the present. Paula, I believe you cannot show me, I believe you cannot show me anywhere where Vladimir Putin said, Ukraine does not exist as a country. Uh, you have to read the July <laughs> 2021 essay by Vladimir Putin, the recent statements on the rest restoration of Russia's historic lands, which include the Baltics, Finland, Poland, and he throws in Alaska every once in a while. <laughs> that is a clear statement of his his the restoration of his, Russia's historic and that's I, why I'm I saying it doesn't matter what he says it matters what he can do and he cannot make good on that he's struggling to get this piece here and that's with a country that but, has but no Danny, army if, no if navy if it's and a, no if it's allies a, if any military action is a struggle for him that seems to play to your opponent's argument that he can be pushed back in, if Ukraine No, is no, because there's a, there's a much bigger difference between going into a 32-member alliance and being able to take up to the western part of here. They, are, they do have the capacity to do if, that, and it's getting bigger every if, day. If you did not feel that Ukraine could not win the war, would you be arguing on the other side? Would you be arguing for continued support If I Ukraine? thought that there was a path to victory, yes. I would. Okay. So I think we also have to highlight the uh, heightened state of miscalculation. Over the weekend, we had a Russian, Russian missile cross into Polish airspace. We have had missile debris in Romania. There is miscalculation here that Agreed. could impact NATO and could move to an Article 5 situation. So it's not just Can you explain Article Ukraine. 5 for the Yes, Article not. 5 of the Washington Treaty that established the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is an attack against one is an attack against all. A very wide uh, 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 article. The only time that NATO has invoked Article 5 was after September the 11th to defend the United States. John Mearsheimer, if your scenario were to come true of a neutral cr Ukraine being created after negotiation, your opponents, I believe, are arguing that that would make the Americans look weak for having let that happen. And overall, they're suggesting that at this point, turning off the, turning off the hose of, of support, which 
is the state at the moment, makes America look weak and unreliable as an ally. What's your response to that? It makes us look weak. We lost. I was in the American military from 1965 to 1975. We lost in Vietnam. I remember it very well. Afghanistan, we were there for 20 years. We lost. The United States has the Midas touch in reverse. It keeps going into these wars that it loses. It's a basic fact of life. And if you pursue a certain policy in Ukraine and you fail, you fail. But, but they're, they're not conceding failure at this point. Well, I well, let me can only your, repeat your, your what Danny opponent. said. The writing is clearly on the wall. They're going to lose. I think a most important element here is what you said. You gave the example of Vietnam. We sent forces into Vietnam. Here, we are not fighting. We are providing support to a country that's seeking it from us, and they are doing the fighting. That's a very critical difference here. You can't have compare apples and oranges. But let me add, the concern here is not only about the European terrain, which we've both mentioned, but also, by the way, we're watching very closely what's happening in the Indo-Pacific. China, which is aligned with Russia in this venture, by the way, is definitely looking at Taiwan. And what happens in Ukraine will definitely have ramifications for what ta China does vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I, I strongly disagree with that because the issues in China have to do with the Asia Indo-Pacific area. It has nothing to do with, U with Ukraine, Russia, because we're not even talking about fighting there. There is some talk about, according to President Biden, the possibility that we could go in and fight on, this, on the behalf of the, the uh, Taiwanese. And the terrain is so radically different, you can't make any comparisons. China will make a decision based on what it can do on the ground, what it can't do, and regardless of what Russia does or doesn't do here, it's not going to change their calculus because it, it depends on the balance of power there. They will change their calculus if the United States is weak in its own actions and not leaving. If it doesn't match up with the balance of power, they aren't going to do it. They're not going to commit suicide. I would suggest that the United States needs to have a winning approach to wars, have a winning mindset. I agree and we see strongly with that. that uh, <laughs> Right now, we have Western and U.S. weapons in Ukraine that are fighting Iranian drones and Iranian missiles, North Korean missiles, in addition to Russian. We are watching NATO kit now deal with a global arms market. This very much links Russia, Iran, North Korea, and of course, China's support for all of those. If we think this is simply contained to Ukraine, we are making a great mistake. Just to pick up on Heather's point, there's an even bigger mistake here, and that is that the principal threat to the United States and the international system today is China. And given that China is a peer competitor and Russia is not, we should go to great lengths to have good relations with the Russians. There are three great powers in the system, and when one of them is your principal adversary, you want to have good relations with the other one. What we have done as a result of our foolish policy in Ukraine is we have driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese, number one. And number two, we've gotten ourselves pinned down in Eastern Europe, which has limited our ability to pivot to Asia and deal with the principal threat to the United States on the horizon. This is a gross failure of balance of power politics 101. Okay, I'd like to go to some audience questions now. And if you can raise your hand, sir, uh, if, if you stand, a mic will be brought to you. Please tell us who you are. Thanks. I'm Mark Rosen. I was the former U.S. Executive Director of the International Monetary Fund. Um, two questions, really. One very quick one. one can to can John, you just do one question? All right. To John Thanks. Mearsheimer. Um, your um, thesis that Ukraine should uh, move towards a neutrality is really based upon a very important premise, which is that Putin is trustworthy. What is the evidence, in your view, that Putin is trustworthy when I think most observers over the last two decades watching Putin is that he is not? My views have not much to do with trustworthiness. The fact is that what Putin has made clear since April 2008 when we announced that Ukraine would become part of NATO was that NATO not incorporate Ukraine into it, and that you instead have a neutral Ukraine. 
This was the subject of the discussions in Istanbul in March 2022, April 2022, making Ukraine neutral. That's what Putin cares about. So there's a very good chance, I wouldn't say it's 100% likely by any means, there's a very good chance if you can create a neutral Ukraine, then this problem will be greatly ameliorated. Right, I want to let the other side answer that question because my sense is J John's position is that the trustworthiness of Putin is irrelevant in terms of the real thing that will happen. The questioner's question was, how do we trust Putin? Would either of you like to take You it? simply cannot trust. He has violated nine international treaties. We have gone way past neutrality. This is, this is wiping out Ukraine as a separate identity civilization language that is taking culture. This is the unification of, of the Russians over the Ukrainians. Uh, just to pull also on, on John's point about China and Russia, the adversary has agency here as well. Uh, and the unlimited par partnership that Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have, have formed, um, it, it, that is, we, we're not going to reverse Nixon that. They see a two-block system emerging against the U.S.-led international order. It's not something that we can pry apart. And I just add to that, I, I just add to that, you're quite right, we can't be trusting Putin. There's the record. But I want to add something about the negotiations that have and the dialogue that has taken place. Do you know that Ukraine came forward early on, Zelensky, and said, you know what, we don't have to go into NATO. He actually said that early on. But you know what the Russian position was? Codify that in your constitution. And Zelensky said, excuse me, we're a sovereign country. We're not going to codify anything in our constitution. Here we were willing to extend something to you. You didn't take it because you wanted to impose on us. That's where you can't trust it all in this, in this path forward here and negotiation. Front row here. If you could stand, please, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. My name is Maxim Bogdanovich. I was born and raised in Minsk, Belarus. And the reason why I am here and not in the Lukashenko military or in a Belarusian prison is because I was lucky enough to study in Boston for the last five years. My question is to you, Professor Mesheima, and it's simple. How do you plan to make neutrality workable for Ukraine? John? The fact is that between 1991 and 2014, Ukraine was neutral. Uh, nobody was talking about bringing Ukraine into NATO because there was a Russian threat. This was a myth that we created after February 22nd, 2014. Hardly anybody saw Russia as a threat. And Ukraine was thriving as a neutral country after it got its independence when the Soviet Union collapsed. There was a good decade plus where it was a neutral country. And I believe you could go back to that as long as you don't present the Russians with a serious threat. The fact is when you deal with great powers, whether it's the United States in the Western Hemisphere or Russia in Eastern Europe, if you put a country that looks like it's a threat to that country on its doorstep, as the Soviets did in Cuba in 1962, the end result is going to be big trouble. Okay, your opponents respond. If, uh, I, I'd like to Poland. say I cannot see how that can come about. And actually, it goes back to the previous question of trust. And let me remind on a little bit of history here, the Budapest Memorandum. By the way, US, UK, Ukraine, Russia, the Ukrainians remember it. They gave up their nuclear weapons in return for the territorial, prote the territorial protection, integrity and protection of their sovereignty. Look at where we are now. They had neutrality. It was, uh, and the Russian actions and their deep desire for completely influencing Ukraine, which was the reason they had two revolutions. The Orange Revolution in 2004, 2005, the, the Revolution of Dignity um, in, uh, in 2014. Why? Because Russia did not, not NATO, nothing to do with NATO. The Ukrainians wanted to get closer to the European Union. They had agency to decide the direction of their country, and Russia could not allow it, hence the invasion of 2014. So neutrality is not the point. It's subjugation, it's complete Russian influence, and the part of the invasion of 2022 was to install a puppet regime, decapitate Zelensky and his government, to put 
a, a puppet regime like Lukashenko in place that would completely do the bidding. Now you you kind of missed a part on 2014 there, though, that the legally elected government, which did lean towards Russia, was overthrown by somebody on our side because we didn't like it. So it was not done the way it's supposed to be, the way the democracy says they took power and drove them out. And that was a big part of what launched the civil war between the East and the West. And we cannot overlook that part. Down front and second row. Yes, sir. my name is uh, Alex Thu. I'm an assistant professor of economics at West Point. Back to the $75 billion that is the earmark for aid that has been provided. Can you elaborate on what proportion of that has been valued materiel supported to Ukraine versus financial capital? And what are the guardrails in place to guard against uh, corruption uh, of money flowing over there? Well, I'm happy to take the corruption. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact figures of material support uh, that has gone. If, if my calculations were correct from the, the Defense Department, I would say up to about 13 billion was of that 46 of the total of 75 package. So, so 46 billion of the 75 was military assistance. Um, a lot of it has been our either our stocks or our some production going into support. Uh, Ukraine's military. Um, there's been an enormous focus on transparency and accountability. In fact, there are multiple inspector generals, this was also written in the National Defense Authorization Act and others, to ensure transparency from QR codes. Um, I, I won't say that there's zero vulnerability, of course, there's corruption uh, within our own country, um, but I, the Ukrainians understand that you know, corruption would be the end of all Western assistance. This is why President Zelensky has fired uh, senior Ukrainian officials when there was uh, some corruption in, in how they were doing uh, mobilization issues. It's not perfect, but there's, an, there's a keen focus both from Washington as well as Kyiv to make sure that uh, the arms get into the right place. And quite frankly, the U Ukrainian people won't stand for that corruption anymore. They're fighting and dying for a very different future. If, if I may just a footnote, on that. Uh, the United States and Western countries have made it very clear to Ukraine that it has to tackle issues of corruption. During wartime and Transparency International and their index is pretty stiff. By the way, during wartime, the Ukrainians have moved up in terms of their quote unquote quotient. They're 104 out of 180. It's worth noting Russia is 144 in terms of corruption. It's on the very low end. But it's significant that they've ta tried to take these steps and really correct themselves in order to be part of the European community, in order to actually be part of the international order in a way that's responsible. Uh, sir, in, in the back? Yeah. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm a human rights lawyer. Um, my question is, is mostly for Danny, but I'd like to hear from everyone. If, as you argue, Russia has just enough power to get to the Dnipro when U.S. support has dried up over the last year, why wouldn't an influx of U.S. support push the scales in favor of Ukraine? Because that's not how combat power works. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It matters how well you, uh, how much uh, trained force you have, and do you have the capacity to <laughs> overcome what the Russians have. And we saw uh, after 200 billion and about a year and a half total of preparation, thousands of, of armored vehicles and, and uh, millions of rounds of ammunition that the West gave to the Ukraine side and tried some short-term uh, training and whatnot, uh, intelligence reform, really all the things, and it didn't even dent the lines. And Russia has only increased it since then. In fact, their power is substantially greater now because now they also have an offensive component. You have got to make a path to where you undo all of those things, and I promise you $60 billion won't even touch the human component of it. It might give a few more uh, rounds of ammunition, but all that's going to do is delay the loss and increase the loss, the cost of Ukraine to lose, but it won't change it. Do you, do you want to challenge that scenario? I or do. I, I mean, look, the Ukrainian military has now completely written new doctrine and new technologies on unmanned underwater vehicles. That has been what their success has been against the Black Sea Fleet. They have completely modernized the use of commercial drones. What they have done with off-the-shelf technology to jerry-rig. Now, desperation does create the, the mother of, of ingenuity. Uh, Ukraine is a laboratory right now of, of innovation. We have defense companies going into Ukraine to watch how they're using U.S. equipment that have never been used that way before, but has been jerry-rigged in the field to be able to do some extraordinary things. So while, yes, they don't fight like the U.S. military, they don't have the doctrine of the U.S. military, and that was in part 
the reason for the counteroffensive was not wholly successful. They didn't have the air support. It wasn't how the U.S. would fight. But they are modernizing. And at the end of this, Ukraine's military will be the most fight capable European military. And I think that also deserves that's, some recognition. That, that's well. not accurate. That's not accurate because they actually, 80% of their drones are getting knocked down with Russian electronic warfare. Russia is also in a, in a laboratory, except they're accelerating. They have more of the drones. They have more of the artillery. They have more of everything. So yes, Ukraine has definitely done that and they had some early big successes, but that's why you don't hear as much about it now because it's getting overtaken by the Russian advances. I'd like to just inject in the conversation about how much the Russians are spending, by the way, on this, and how long can they really sustain it? Do you know that it's uh, basically two billion a week in terms of, of, of what they are putting into their fighting? Uh, uh, a special military uh, operation costs 300 million a day. And by the way, did you notice that actually in order to fund this, they're taking it away from the civilian side, taking it into the military industrial side, investing in it. And in this case, they're actually planning to, Putin announced that he's looking at upping taxes 15, 20%. They've cut off the S-400 to India. If you've taken note of that, that's sale. They're not able to do it. By the way, they're really stressed and strained. I wouldn't say that when you look at the military, quite frankly, when most people step back and really evaluate the Russian military, we're dramatically surprised at how poorly they have performed. Mike's coming, but I need it to be brief, please. Looking at whether uh, the U.S. Uh, should be providing more funds to Ukraine. Can you consider how that and the issues that you have discussed this evening uh, have been, to Dr. Mearsheimer, how have they been reported in the American press? All right, actually, I think that's a legitimate question. And, and because we, we have a dispute about what the facts on the ground are, we have a dispute about what the perception of how this thing is going is. And I, I'll start with you. Um, I'll start with you, Heather, and I'll come to John. Heather, do you, think, do you think that the portrayal of the Ukrainians is I, optimistic or pessimistic? Well, I think the journalism of the war, the embed of journalists has been fairly accurate. Um, we also have researchers of Russia's military embedded with Ukrainian forces watching and observing how they're. So I, I think it has been portrayed. I think what you, you know, on the, the counteroffensive, I think it was a policy um, issue to place so much emphasis on the success of that counteroffensive that the policy wasn't uh, the long term and the winning strategy uh, victory. Uh, that's what was missing. But I think that the, the, the journalistic approach and Ukrainian journalists, quite frankly, uh, have been uh, phenomenal at what they're reporting uh, locally as and well. So, and so you, you would base your, your let's keep going argument on, on the reporting out there. It gives you signs and indications that victory is possible. Well, it is accurate in describing the challenges that Danny and John have outlined. It has also been very accurate in describing if the, U, the United States and Europe have, would have given much greater lethality okay. ahead of time, things would have been very Can different. Can take it to the other side? Well, I would just say that uh, I think it's very difficult for us to make our argument because it revolves around the claim that the Ukrainians are doomed on the battlefield and that there has been a massive shift in the balance of power that cannot be rectified. And the problem that we face sitting up here making this argument to you is that most of you read the mainstream media and the mainstream media tells a very different story because the mainstream media is basically a cheerleader for the Ukrainians. And what they do is they always portray the Ukrainians in the most favorable light and portray the Russians in the most unfavorable light. So it seems to many people that what we're saying makes no sense when you compare it to what's in the media. But the fact is the media's coverage of this war has been abysmal. Well, war crimes <laughs> tend to get negatively <laughs> press. In negative the very press. back? Yes. <laughs> uh, the wait for the mic is right behind you. And I'm afraid this might be our last question. Sure, I just want to pick up on that last point that was raised of Mark Simodiak with the Center for Eastern European Democracy. The mainstream media uh, does are, often are, portray... Are we, are we going to spend a lot quick. of time on the media Fair, question? No, no, I want to get into disinformation and how it plays in. Fair enough. Yeah, so 
Uh, I, I specifically, I want to touch on the report that released, was released yesterday by the Institute of the Study of War. Can you tell us what date we're talking about? Uh, yeah, sorry, excuse me. The, the, the report that was released by the Institute of Study of War, March 27th, 2024, which stated that Russia cannot defeat Ukraine or the West if it mobilizes its resources because the GDP of Ukraine's allies is approximately 63 trillion compared to Russia's 1.9 trillion. So it does seem to me, I understand there's a manpower deficiency there, but the, the, the GDP is certainly on our side, or excuse me, the Ukrainian side. And so the, I, the question what, is, the you. question is, the report goes on to state that the war being unwinnable is a disinformation campaign. And so I want to understand, how does your narrative help a negotiated solution? GNP doesn't tell you much about who wins particular wars. We had a much bigger GNP than the North Vietnamese did, and we lost. We had a much bigger GNP than the Afghanis did, and we lost. What you have to do in these cases is you have to look at the particular context. And what we're telling you is that when you look at the weaponry on the side of the Ukrainians, and you look at the manpower problems that they face compared to the Russians, they're doomed. And no matter what our GNP is, and no, much how much, no matter how much aid we give them, they're not gonna win this war. So I will summarize the, the what it is is, the Russians can't right now defeat Ukraine, but they can defeat us. They can make sure that the West does not provide the assistance that Ukraine needs. So they're doomed. They are corrupt. This isn't winnable. You should walk away. That is a tactic of Russian disinformation because it's easier to make us back off. And you are, you are quite right to bring up Russian disinformation in this because, by the way, that is a tactic that seeks to undermine a strategy. Ukrainians have been very resilient. I mentioned at the beginning, if we listen to the fact of the assessments and the disinformation about Ukraine not being able to last past four days, I mean, as I said at the beginning, we are now into year three. And that concludes the question and answer portion of the program. And now we move into closing statements from each debater in turn, starting with John Mearsheimer. Once again, uh, the question, should Congress stop funding the war in Ukraine? John, you are a strong yes, stop the funding. Your last chance to make your case. Thank you again, John. I want to conclude with a short story. 58,000 men died in the Vietnam War uh, when Richard Nixon was elected in November of 1968, it was very clear uh, that the war was lost and he was elected on the promise that he was going to put an end to the war. He did not put an end to the war. Uh, the war did not end until 1975. Uh, from the time Nixon took office until 1975, uh, April, 31st, April 30th, 1975, 21,000 Americans died. That's 21,000 out of those 58,000 Americans died. When Vietnam fell, South Vietnam fell, Saigon fell on April 30th, 1975. It was a complete and decisive victory for the North Vietnamese. We lost categorically. I ask you, would, not, would it not have made much more sense for the United States to have ended the war in January 1969 when Nixon moved into the White House. Because if we had ended the war then and we had suffered a defeat then, just as we did in 1975, 21,000 Americans wouldn't have their names on the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. That's the basic argument we're making here. We're making an argument that if you continue this war by funding the Ukrainians, more and more Ukrainians are gonna die. Our argument is that this is a deeply immoral way of doing business. Yes, it's true that we're not doing the dying and it's the Ukrainians who are doing the dying, but do you wanna be you wanna know what I think about that? That argument makes me sick to my stomach. I hate what's happened to the Ukrainians, and I think it's in due in large part to misguided policies by the United States of America. Next up is Ambassador Paula Dobyansky, again answering no to the question, Congress should not stop funding the war in Ukraine. Your closing, please. Okay, thank you. 
Ukraine has a famous poet, Tadas Shevchenko, and he said the following, the most important thing in the world will always be the people who are with you in the most difficult times. To me, this is one of the most difficult times and challenges that Ukraine is facing. Ukraine obviously wants to prevail. We want Ukraine to prevail as a sovereign and independent nation. I come away from this debate and discussion that when you evaluate the costs, which we had spoken to, the costs of inaction here, not providing aid to Ukraine, clearly outweigh the costs of any potential costs of helping and providing aid to Ukraine. Let me mention the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation actually went back to the Cold War. They found that against the Soviet Union during the Cold War, it led to American military expenditures of $13 trillion. Right now, that's about $26 trillion in 2024 dollars. Putin's regime has identified the U.S. as its principal adversary and is working hard to undermine our particular interests. If we understand this, military and economic support to Ukraine is an extraordinarily cost-effective investment. Ukraine's degrading of the Russian armed forces is a strategic bar bargain and costs no American lives. I'm going to end on this note. I have two colleagues, Deborah Kagan and John Herbst, from the Atlantic Council, and they had an op-ed in Newsweek. They said, many of America's best and most prescient leaders understood that even if we want to take a breather, our enemies that just keep on doing what they do. We should not have to remind ourselves yet again what happens when the United States walks away. It never ends well. So on that particular note, I would say we should not walk away from aiding Ukraine at this very crucial time and ensuring that it does get the political stance that it wants to be independent and free and sovereign. Thank you. Danny Davis, you're up next. Again, uh, you're answering yes to the question. That you're saying that Congress should stop funding the war in Ukraine. You're closing, please. So you're in a high-stakes uh, poker match, five-card draw. You got on the other side of the table somebody that you don't like at all. You hate him, actually. He's a nasty person, has a terrible reputation. You've been playing several rounds. Uh, you know, one person's raised, the other person's just, you know, raised the stakes a little bit more, and they keep playing, they go around, and now then you've got a pretty big pot in the middle of the, of the place there. And you still got a bunch of money over here, but there's a big pot here, and you do not want to lose that uh, round right there. And the problem is, after all the things have been played, he has just raised up and put a bunch of money in there. Your choice now is you either take the money you got, put it in the pot, or you fold your hand. You look at your hand, you have a pair of red twos. Yikes, that's not a good thing to be spending more money with, but here's the problem. You're aware of what his cards are too. He's got three aces and a pair of tens. So you could fold and he's gonna win all that money and it's gonna be as bad as you think. He's gonna crow, he's gonna say a bunch of stuff. He's gonna take all the stuff that you've invested, all the money you've already put in there, he's gonna take it. But if you don't fold and you say, no, I just can't lose to this guy and I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet his call, I'm gonna call him and I'm gonna put all this money in there, you're still gonna lose. And that's where we are in this game right now, in, in, this, in this war right now, I'm sorry. It's not a game at all. Because it's not just a bunch of money. It's not just the $60 billion that Congress is trying to get out of there. It's the lives of the Ukrainians. And I cannot say this, I wanna leave this so clear. If you play this game further, and you give more money, it will extend the war. It will not change the outcome. More Ukrainians will die. More Ukrainian lands will be going to the Russian side. They're going to win. The question now is do we fold and preserve what we have, what Ukraine has now and end the dying? Or do we keep playing in the hopes that we win and instead more Ukrainians die and then it's probably gonna be a negotiated settlement not from a position of strength, but maybe even in terms of surrender. That's where I think the more likely outcome is if we keep going. Thank you. Um, and the last word goes to Heather Conley. Um, once again, you are arguing that we should not be, the Congress should not stop funding to Ukraine. And this is your chance to close. Do you hear it? Do you hear how loudly history is speaking to us right now? I wonder if this is what it felt like in the 1930s in the debate about the U.S. getting into the, the, the war in Europe. It's not our fight. It's expensive. We can stay at home. Our, our oceans will protect us. And then when we were attacked 
and we entered the war, 1942 looked a little doomed to us, but we did not stop. And then after the war, the United States made a very costly investment. And in fact, we're going to honor two very important anniversary dates. On April 3rd, 1948, Congress, on a bipartisan basis, invested in our European allies the Marshall Plan, something my organization is named for, and we're a living memorial to that. We didn't have to do that. It was expensive. Let's walk away. No, we invested in our allies. They are now our largest trade and investment partner. April 4th, 1949. We needed to secure that prosperity, that investment. We created NATO, 12 countries, 75 years ago, 32 countries today. This is our generation's moment to make a decisive call. Ukraine is our generation's investment in their reconstruction and in their defense. I promise you, I promise you, just as it did in the 20th century, this rebounds on America's prosperity and our security. This is an investment worth making. John, Ukrainians are choosing to die for their freedom. That is their choice. We have to give them the means to fight for their freedom because as the Polish resistance said in World War II, for our freedom and yours, we need to fund Ukraine so they can win this war, strengthening America's prosperity and security. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, everyone, that is a wrap on this debate.